So in this session after lunch, we're going to be focusing on the, uh, in the first part of the session at least, on uh, a series of building performance evaluation case studies, this time looking at non-domestic buildings. And we're going to start off with a, a presentation from Hester Brough from Field and Clegg Bradley Studios, um, followed by uh, two other presentations, and we'll then take the questions as we did this morning at the end of, the, of this series of presentations. So I'll pass you over to, uh, to Hester. Um, hello, my name's Hester, and um, I joined Field and Clegg in 2004. Um, and since then, I've been involved with some really fantastic buildings, um, many of which have undergone POE work. And I just thought I'd use this as an opportunity to um, present some of our findings from those and some of the valuable outcomes. Um, so there's two projects I'd like to talk about today. On your, um, on your left is Woodland Trust headquarters in Grantham, and on your right is the NICU neonatal unit um, in the RUH in Bath. So as a, as a practice, why do, we, why do we do POE? Well, it's really the opportunity to learn from past mistakes, to understand what worked well, and the opportunity to review, fine-tune, and feedback. Um, and really, the opportunity that that entails is to give our clients added, added, um, added uh, um, value for their money, really. So the Woodland Trust was a culmination of um, experience of a long line of office development um, and POE projects as well. Um, we worked with the same team on four consecutive buildings, gaining experience as a collective, reviewing and fine-tuning, and carrying forward what worked well and um, learning from past mistakes. So the key lesson that we took from Helis National Trust, which was actually um, preceded uh, Woodland Trust, was to keep it simple and to do it well. And this became um, our sort of project mantra, if you like. So for the Woodland Trust, this meant getting the basics right, um, particularly simplifying the external skin. The building's constructed almost entirely of cross-laminated timber, and it's then wrapped in a thick wood fiber insulation jacket um, and then finished with timber larch cladding. And the simple detail of external walls with the thermal continuity of the CL CLT structure was one of the reasons why the annual gas consumption was so significantly below the design estimate. So feedback from the bus questionnaire of the first POE project was pretty positive, but it did highlight areas of concern um, where the building didn't quite perform to um, as we would have expected, and namely these was, this was health and temperature. So despite the first couple of years of occupancy being um, relatively cool, in the, uh, the, uh, the summers being relatively cool, the office actually had a tendency to overheat. And this spurred on a POE follow-on project um, sponsored by Innovate UK to carry forward some detailed investigation of operation into night cooling and also monitoring temperatures and thermal um, heat flows with some static and time-lapse um, infrared thermatography. Um, with all the benefits of the CLT structure, we were faced with a massive problem, really, of how to achieve the required thermal mass to allow the natural ventilation to function as efficiently as possible. And we came up with this as an option, and this was the using the exact amount of concrete required for thermal mass and making it work structurally compositely with the timber, and we named these the concrete radiators. The concrete radiators help to improve thermal stability, absorbing the heat during the day and either carrying it forward to the following day or removing it uh, via cross-ventilation overnight. A series of data logging equipment was set up on the concrete radiators, and this comprised a number of sensors um, 30 in total, measuring heat flux, uh, surface and inner slab temperature, and mean radiant temperature. Um, there were five data loggers, four, externally and one ex uh, four internally and one externally, that then recorded our findings. Um, holes were drilled into the panels, and the sensors installed so that the logger would record the p um, performance of the radiator to the whole of the radiator and not just to the surface surface. Um, the surface of it. The top image, um, the top image shows the uh, measurements on Friday evening after the end of the working week and before the windows were opened for night cooling. The bottom image was taken on Saturday morning just before the windows were closed at the end of night cooling and the mean temperature of the radiators had fallen by almost four degrees. 
So the radiators were achieving their objective. So what was the reason for the overheating? Well, the team identified four principal um, reasons for the underperformance of the night cooling strategy. Restrictions on the window openings from both the insurers and the health and safety policy went beyond design regulations. Um, the incorrect external temperature sensor of the BMS, and this was a problem as the air temperature was recorded eight degrees higher than that in the car park. And the BMS, thinking it was very hot outside, often kept the windows closed unnecessarily. It would also feel cold in the early in the morning because the furniture and the lightweight elements were at a much lower temperature than the concrete. The FM manager was getting complaints and choosing um, to therefore not initiate night cooling. And an overcomplicated uh, st um, strategy, basically. And we looked to transfer some of the um, control over to the FM manager. But all of this meant that um, the overheating COT levels were at a very high level due to the lack of ventilation and such efficient air tightness of the building, and this gave rise to the headaches and feelings of poor health reported by the bus questionnaire. So the actions taken, the relocation of the external air temperature sensor, uh, tempering the monitoring and control strategies, removing the interlock between the heating and night cooling with independent night cooling programs for weekends and weekdays, and changing the temperature used to control the night ventilation to the average of the open plan offices only, as originally this was for the meeting rooms that was included in the average, and just generally making it easier for the FM manager to adjust settings and time programs. So in conclusion, the concrete radiators have achieved their objective, increasing thermal capacity and lowering peak temperatures, however not without considerable intervention during this POE process. The research <coughs> demonstrates that care is needed in design, commissioning and fine-tuning of natural ventilation systems. And importantly, had we not carried out this POE study, then Woodland Trust would still maybe be suffering from the high summer temperatures and reports of ill health. And this demonstrates to us just how necessary the POE process in providing our clients with fully functional building. So the second project I'd like to talk about briefly is um, a piece of POE work um, that we did for, well, that was undertaken for the Dyson Centre at the neonatal unit and the YUH in Bath. Um, this was uh, Field & Clegg's first venture into healthcare architecture, and we had no preconceived ideas of what healthcare architecture should be. And so this, along with the fact that the budget was, the bud the budget was publicly funded, made it possible to challenge assumptions about what would be appropriate and possible. The, care, the unit cares for premature babies for often up to three to four months at a time, so it was imperative to put babies and families at the centre of the design. The old unit was cramped, inefficient, dark and stressful for users, with a total lack of privacy for our parents. The design ethos was attention to emotions alongside hard-edged medicine. We organised the space in a horseshoe arrangement around a centralised staff base where the parents could clearly see babies progressing on the journey from critical care through to going home. And psychologically, this was very important for both the staff and the parents. The users of the building had different and often conflicting needs which needed to be balanced. For example, the need to control light and sound. Premature babies have to be nurtured in a relatively qu um, quiet and very subdued lighting, and the staff benefit from natural light. None of the cot spaces are in direct sunlight, and the care rooms have very controlled lighting, but the circulating spaces enjoy flood of natural daylight and reflected sunlight, allowing staff and parents to stay in touch with the outside world. We proposed a palette of natural materials, particularly the use of exposed CLT, even to the critical care rooms, and guided this through the infection control team. Careful planning of the spaces and services allowed the care rooms to be uncluttered, and the exposed timber contributed massively to the calm and warm feeling to what are, what are actually some real cutting-edge um, clinical spaces. Design had to be considered for all, including siblings. 
So quickly onto the POE, and I use this term actually um, pretty loosely, as the clinical, clinician team responsible for this strand of work. We're information gathering and collecting data even before the, uh, this work had begun on the new NICU and briefing had started. Um, primarily as a need to, to fund um, the project. And they were also pretty well briefed then to be aware of what issues um, we would need to overcome with the new NICU. So there are four areas of interest, building data, parent well-being and behaviour, infant well-being and staff well-being and behaviour. The tools used for the evaluations were questionnaires, interviews, cot side diaries, baby movement detection and staff tracking and light meters. The baby movement detectors were small, self-controlled, self-contained wireless devices mounted on the baby's nappies to measure breathing, restlessness, and sleep patterns. Nurses were located by triangular, tri um, Wi-Fi triangulation and tags. Their location information was recorded continuously through a 20-hour cycle, a 24-hour cycle, and used to calculate the time spent in clinical rooms caring for babies and for the non-clinical rooms, such as the nurse staff stations. So following are a number of, of graphs that show the old and the new NICU compared. The old is in red and the new is in green. And this graph compares the acoustics of the new and the old unit. And as you can see, noise levels have been almost halved. The NICU is brighter, allowing natural daylight to penetrate the building whilst giving control to the care rooms and the ability to dim lights during the evening. And the questionnaire results. The parents reported that compared to the old unit, they felt less cramped, they had less interference from noise and light, they felt less in the way, they felt more comfortable breastfeeding. And testament to this was that 90% of the babies on the old unit, the new unit, went home breastfeeding compared to only 64 on the old. The results show, um, showed that the parents' anxiety levels decreased significantly with time spent in the new NICU, whereas anxiety increased for the parents spent in time in the old NICU. The new building increased the length of time the parents spent in the new unit, and with that came more physical contact and positive touch from the parent, crucial for development. Critically, the new unit was allowing babies to get more sleep, so desperately required to grow and develop, giving them greater chance of survival. And this really concludes a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the POE projects I've been involved with. Um, and I just wanted to really leave you with a quote from um, Bill Bordas, who's been key to much of our POE work. The importance of BPE is in understanding what works and what needs to be improved and in influencing future policy, client, and industry practices. Without this, attempts at producing more sustainable, energy-efficient buildings may well disappoint. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hester. Um, our next speaker is Kevin Coolin from Acom. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, two BP projects which ACOM were involved in. Um, uh, incidentally, I've got quite a lot of slides in, in my pack today, probably too many to talk about, and I just put them in because I want you to have them as part of the slide deck afterwards, but I'm just going to skip through them, so uh, it's going to be fairly, fairly rapid. Hopefully, we can keep up. So you know all that stuff, probably, um, but that's in the pack. So at ACOM, we did five BP projects altogether, but I'm just going to talk about two of them today. Firstly, the National Composite Centre, and secondly, Estover Community College, although I think they might come in a different order in the presentation. Um, so those are the ones. Let's, let's move on. So first of all, Est Estover Community College, which is a high school in Plymouth. It started out as Torbridge High. That was its old name, and it reinvented itself as part of the uh, development project. Uh, we looked there at occupant satisfaction, energy performance, how the renewable uh, systems were working, what the internal conditions were like, and then kind of tried to draw out some lessons for industry from that. There's some interesting stuff. It was uh, designed by Bill and Claire Bradley, incidentally. Um, that's the new school, the new layout of the school. It's mostly new. I've got a pointer. Is there a pointer? That's the top. Top right, okay. So this is mostly new. Uh, that's what the old school looked like. Very enclosed, very kind of dark. 
Um, and you can probably see, actually, it's not that difficult for people who move into a new school from that would think, actually, this is quite a lot better than I used to have. So maybe bear that in mind when we get to the occupant satisfaction survey. Now, interestingly, the POE initially was meant to be looking at just this area in green, phase one. And that's what we applied for funding for and got funding for. Uh, but actually, when we got on site, what we realized was that the, the metering was set up in such a way that it didn't allow us to disaggregate that portion of the site. So in the end, what we ended up doing was including phase two. You can see this slightly strange split here. This is a single building, but actually it's built in two, two pieces. So of course, when we came to look at that in particular, that was triggered as a science block, incidentally. And then phase three. So ultimately, what we did was we looked at the whole school and not just phase one, which was which is great. Uh, it's a bit more complicated for us, but you know, it, it led to some perhaps more holistic results, maybe. Um, some more facts and figures about the building there. One thing to draw your attention to, actually, is the fact that you've got this 500 kilowatt biomass boiler in place, as lots of schools had in, at that point, because if you included a biomass boiler, and I'm simplifying here, if you include a biomass boiler in your new school, you've got an extra 50 pounds a square meter to build it. So, hence, biomass boilers, and lots of them. Uh, and also this mini district heating network, too which is important. So we carried out just one um, building use study uh, survey of the occupants to find out how satisfied they were. We had a relatively low response rate because teachers were incredibly busy uh, and we really struggled actually to get the, get the uh, surveys to them. BUS is quite prescriptive. You have to do all the surveys on one day. They have to be paper-based and so on. So that maybe was a little bit of a, um, made it a bit more tricky to administer perhaps. But the results that came back were really interesting. They were some of the best results that the BUS has ever seen. Overwhelmingly positive. Nothing even in kind of that central, you know, kind of ambiv ambivalent area. Everything very, very much on the, on the green side, which was great. Um, despite the fact that people were satisfied with the building, there were uh, one or two um, things. Uh, like, for instance, the main entrance, which is this kind of slightly horseshoe-shaped affair here, actually created a, a, a vortex, I'm going to call it. Um, it. It was like a bit of a hurricane on a windy day. It was, it was a real struggle to get the door open and those kind of things. So it was obviously, you know, maybe the first impression of that was, was tricky. So I think that was a lesson that, that was learned uh, to carry forward to other projects. Um, occupants really liked the, the natural vent of this building. So it was pretty much all naturally ventilated, apart from some of the um, IT areas. Um, and... What they had was night ventilation, so they could open it, or, or day ventilation, of course. We didn't tell them not to open it during the day. Um, on the outside of the building, with some cross vent, these kind of fan-like windows above the doors into a central atrium of each block. Uh, in fact, they liked it so much that they decided to leave them open overnight, including in the winter, uh, which um, then led to them complaining that it was cold in the mornings. But, hey, there you go. Uh, they, they did have some guidance about when to open the windows, incidentally. Um, they had some LEDs. Red, fully open the windows. Orange, partially open the windows. Green, you can even close, open them if you want to, but the air's fine. The problem with that was, it wasn't quite as big as that. Um, it was about this big, uh, which meant that the teacher really just couldn't see it from where they were teaching. So that perhaps was an issue. Um, the lighting was one of the issues that perhaps people were slightly less satisfied with in the building. All of the classrooms had a, had a system where if you walked into the classroom, nothing would happen until you pushed a button. And when you push a button, you would turn on the automatic controls, lights would come on, and they'd go off when you left, and so on and so forth. It's quite a common uh, form of control. One of the problems was there perhaps wasn't quite enough storage for the teacher in some classrooms, so they introduced extra storage. Unfortunately, they introduced it directly in front of the light switch, which meant that um, light controls didn't quite function as they should but you live and learn, I guess. The other thing, I'm just going to return to this biomass boiler. I mean, classically, I've seen lots of schools where biomass boilers have been installed. Um, potentially, I I'll throw it out there, maybe for the reason that you get some extra money to build it that way, or you did um, back in the day. Um, but actually, what happened was, once the building was finished, there was no maintenance contract in place for that biomass boiler. And shortly after the building started operating, there was a fault on the control system, no maintenance contract in place, and the boilers didn't really run very much at all. Uh, added to that, all of the intelligence about the way that system worked was vested in one guy, and partway through the, the POE, he went on to extend it sickly for three months, and at that point, the school really lost confidence in the biomass boiler because they didn't understand how to use it, and it was pretty much switched off. So th the outcome is that the green there is, is the heat load that's being met by the, bi by the gas boilers, and the blue bit is what's been met by the biomass boiler. So you can see they're doing very, very little work when they should actually have been doing the lion's share, really, theoretically. 
Um, comparison against the EPC in actual, well, we know, I guess, hopefully we, we all know that the EPC isn't really any uh, great indicator of what the building might do in real life, so we'll just maybe skip over that. Um, <laughs> the other thing that we found when we went there was that the metering was a real issue, and this is a really common theme that runs through, I would say, 95% of the buildings we've looked at, and we've probably looked at in the last five or six years, maybe 50 buildings or something. So when we got there, there was about 30% of the building, we just didn't know what it was doing. We didn't know what that energy was. And through an awful lot of hard work from Andrew at the University Extra, I have to say, not necessarily myself, um, we got that down in the end to about 2%. And, and actually, the stuff that we filled in wasn't because, some of it was because we got meters sorted out and got them fixed and got them connected, but part of it was because we had to start to make robust estimates of what we thought actually was going on. So metering, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I won't come into that too much. That's um, each of the dark green bars is one of the blocks in the building. And I ought to say the three worst performers are um, a retained block here from the old school, which wasn't replaced. This is a special, special educational needs block, which is not naturally ventilated. It's all mechanically ventilated and therefore uses more energy. And this is the sports hall. Um, I, 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 the sports hall, for some reason, there's hardly any kit in it, obviously. It's just a big open space, but it used more uh, energy than anything else. And the reason for that, we discovered in the end, was because there was no way of controlling the heating. Um, and the heating was on. <laughs> just on, that's it. Um, so I, I, that's a uh, uh, comparison against benchmarks. Feel free to look at that in your own time and enjoy it. Um, so lessons for industry, uh, key lessons I think are around metering. That was a real problem and Andrew spent probably the best part of the first year just trying to get to grips with what the meters were telling us, why they weren't reading anything, why they were reading something we didn't expect, why things weren't connected and so on. So metering, 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 it's so important if you really want to manage your building effectively. Um, more effective ways to communicate with users. One of the issues we found that users didn't really understand how to use the natural ventilation system. And of course, it's fine if you're a user on day one and you get some training from the contract or whatever, and he says, this is how you do it, open it then, close it then, switch to this, pull that, you know, wiggle the other thing, and that's great. The trouble is, if you're somebody who comes into the building three months after it started, or six months or a year after, you don't get that training. So we need to find better ways to communicate with, uh, with users. And we thought the occupant satisfaction survey was actually a bit of a missed opportunity as well. The bus is very prescriptive, as I say, and there perhaps isn't enough contextual analysis of the information that we got, because actually some of the most useful stuff that we found wasn't from the Likert scale, you know, one to five, I like it, I don't like it. Actually, it was in the comments that were written afterwards. And the actual process of the BS doesn't really do anything with those. Okay, moving on quickly. National Composite Centre. This is a uh, co-funded research building outside of Bristol, funded interestingly by the UK and Bristol University and other industry partners um, to develop research into new composite materials, as the name suggests, I suppose. Some interesting facts and figures. Move on. Bream, excellent. That's nice. Um, oh, the other thing, nice big PV array there, so that, that's, that's also good. Uh, that's what it looks like. Big workshop on the ground floor, double height space, mezzanine offices. I'm flying now. Um, okay, so ventilation. Interesting, that big workshop space, quite unusually perhaps, it was a displacement ventilation system, which maybe was a, um, an interesting way of, of um, you know, servicing the space. In the offices, they were mixed mode, so there's some automatic fan lights on the top, which the users could override with a button for like an hour at a time or whatever. Uh, night cooling. Um, one, of the, one of the unintended features that the ventilation system has was a uh, squirrel infiltration feature. Um, <laughs> talk about in a moment. Um, the air tightness was um, quite a bit better than, than um, was modelled in the original part L, so, so that was also great. 10% better in terms of BR, thank you. Um, so key findings for the NCC, and I'm going to come into more detail in a second. It, one thing we ought to say, I chose to say this about Estover too, it's actually a great success in terms of a, a place to teach. And the NCC similarly is really successful in terms of being a commercial proposition for research of, of new composite materials. And it's so uh, successful, they've just built another one right next door to it, basically the same, um, with a few uh, minor improvements. Uh, the occupants are largely satisfied with the building. I mean, there are some indications it's a bit too hot in the summer occasionally in the offices. It's a really great dynamic space to kind of, you know, generate all that research and, and sort of a hot house of, of interesting thinking. Um, and the benchmarking thing, well, the benchmarking was okay, but it's a pretty unique building. It's got some very unique equipment in it, very cutting edge, and actually, although we did compare it to benchmarks, it probably don't, doesn't mean all that much. Um, yep, we also spotted some opportunities for saving energy and fed those through to the development of NCC2. So, uh, EPC, I've already talked about EPCs. Uh, Regate Actual, that's interesting. Again, look at that in your own time. Um, so this is that benchmark thing. This is the actual consumption of the NCC building. 
and we did our best to construct a benchmark from what was available, but really, it's just so unique, it, it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny, unfortunately. Big PV array, which was, which was great, and it worked really well, and in fact, it produced about 3% more than was predicted, which is good. I mean, PV really, you know, you should be reasonably accurate at predicting what energy PV will generate. The interesting thing was, though, that actually at design stage, they reckoned around about 47% of the energy would be exported, and in fact, only 6% was exported. And that's not a problem necessarily, but it does very much change the economics of the way the PV array works. It's a big array, it's a big investment, and the issue, of course, is that it's much more valuable to use the energy on-site than off-site. So if you were thinking of investing in PV array and you saw this, you might have a different conclusion to your assessment of whether to include it or not than if you saw this. So that's something to think about, even though the, the, the output was very similar to what was designed. So here again, metering was a big issue. In fact, metering is such an issue that we have this strange thing. This is the line of the incoming meter, so this should be the maximum we ever see. This is the total of all the submeters, and you can see there's a teeny little issue there. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> that took us a long time to figure out, and what it was in the end was about 10 out of around about 80 meters, the timestamp had moved. So instead of it thinking it was today, it was thinking it was two and a half days' time. So we added them all together, they just didn't, didn't work. So anyway, that was an issue, which we managed to get into in the end. This is an interesting one. The meter on the panel works fine, works great. When you get back to the BMS, you get to a million kilowatt hours, and it just chops that last number off. Problem. Problem. So we got it right in the end. Thank you. Um, gas consumption was another interesting one. Uh, the boilers used the lion's share, but interestingly, when we first looked, what we realized after a little while was the gas meter had been set up and was a factor of 10 out. So what we thought was 100 cubic feet or whatever was actually 1,000 cubic feet. So that was a little confusing, but we, we did get there in the end. So that was, that was something, I suppose. Um, the thing about being too hot, actually what we found was it's a massive space to heat that big workshop area, very tall and of course right adjacent to the offices. And we found that actually the air was being supplied at around about 30 degrees at times into that workshop space. And you can imagine if that's happening, offices are right next door, top of that high level space, all the kit working in the bottom, the temperature up there, pretty hot. And actually of course that seeps through to the, to the offices. So potentially that was one of the reasons for that. And also perhaps the vent not being used properly. Um, much higher response rate on the build and user survey. People maybe not quite, uh, okay, I thought I've got a graph there, not quite as satisfied at Estova, but generally pretty good. Nothing in the red, which was nice. Um, automatic windows, users found frustrating because they would just operate on their own, obviously, as you would expect, they're automatic. And they had a switch there, um, which they could use to override it. And um, of course, the FM provider said, well, look, don't fiddle with it, you'll only make it worse. So they put the very nice uh, in informative label, do not touch on all those, all those window switches. That was an ideal. Oh, incidentally, and this is where the squirrel getting in overnight or stealing people's sandwiches and things. So on NCC2, they put some grills over. Very sensible. There's the, there's the graph I thought I was going to get earlier. Again, look at that in your own time. It's uh, very interesting. We did some interesting stuff fed back into the NCC2. It's not very often you get that opportunity to feed directly into the pretty much the same design team. Those are, those are very useful comments and hopefully will make the NCT, NCC2 even more successful than NCC1. Um, some lessons for industry there, but I'm just going to skip on to the last slide, which is really just to say that actually both these buildings, in terms of their primary function, were actually really successful, but there are some valuable lessons to learn, and uh, please, I encourage you to go away and have a look at my very interesting slide deck in your own time. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kevin. Uh, now we have Julie Godefroy from uh, Hawley. So I'm here to tell you about a hotel in London, which again was funded by Innovate UK. And no, okay, sorry. Um, so it's a hotel in London, near between Farringdon and Moorgate. It's been open for three years, and the start of our study basically coincided, coincided with the opening of the hotel. Hawley had been involved in the design from early planning stages. And then it was a D and B contract, so we didn't finish the design. You promised I was in heaven. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm not going to be able to do it on automatic because I'm very sure that's not the right time. Um, I'm not sure why it's automatic, but um, I think it can be removed. But I thought we had to Otherwise, I'd really have to talk very fast. Can we not tell it not to do it? Oh, yeah, brilliant. 
<laughs> As you can see, I don't really like technology, <laughs> so You've got two minutes. that might influence the conclusions of my study. Uh, so it's an 80-bedroom hotel with two restaurants, which operate more or less independently, one on the ground floor, one on the top floor. The top floor, well, all of it is very successful independently and as a hotel. The top floor restaurant has a Michelin star already. And <laughs> so um, what we did essentially as part of the BP study is, as everyone, um, a BUS survey on the permanent users, i.e. the staff. We also did our own methodology for assessing the satisfaction of guests. And to be quite blunt, a lot of the BP study funded what should happen on buildings which doesn't, which is enhanced handover and nagging at the contractors to sort out defects, with much more focus on performance than would happen otherwise. Um, so it's a building in central London in a powerful local authority, Islington. They asked for the usual carbon reduction savings, and we had to demonstrate an efficient facade, so not highly glazed. We even, even had some opening windows, which is quite unusual in an urban site for a posh hotel. There were actually more before VE, and I would like to say if there are QSs around that actually people use opening windows. In a boutique luxury hotel in a noisy central London location, people have asked to change bedroom if they didn't have a window. So there is some value to users. It also has um, a lot of efficient controls, so not key cards because that's seen as a little bit too naff for boutique hotels, but smart controls that make sure that the essentials are switched off when people are away. Um, Preheating or pre-cooling of the bedrooms, metering, and a CHP unit which initially had thermal stores until um, they were designed out by the m contractor. Um, this is another slide like yours that um, we want to skip. So it's Briam Excellent at post construction as well, and 40% better than Partel, which um, we'll come on to. There were quite a lot of checks done on the hotel in theory. So Briam post construction review, which, if you get a pedantic Briam assessor, actually has quite a lot of value in providing someone else to check everything that is meant to have been done. Um, there was a thermography survey being done for the BRIAM credit. Um, the conclusions of the surveys was that mostly it was fine and there were some defects identified, but because the BRIAM credit didn't ask for the defects to be rectified, no action was taken. And similarly, the air pressure test in theory showed very good results, but in fact, digging into it through the BPE, we realized it had been done way earlier than it should have been with temporary seals. So the results were not meaningless, but bordering on meaningless. So th there's that, what I'm trying to say is there's loads of checks that we actually all could be using to much better value than they are at the moment. That's the slide that we all have about the use of Partel results. Um, we had God knows how many modeling runs done under various versions of Partel and EPCs, all of them reasonably useless. So in terms of predicting energy consumption, I'm sure you know we all have a range between the very, very rough SIBSI benchmarks. Some of them are quite out of date, and certainly for hotels, we rely on actually quite a small sample of buildings. Um, and everybody thinks they're special. So the benchmarks never apply to them anyway. Um, at the other end of the scale, there's obviously prediction modeling with dynamic software and hand calculations and additions of this and that. But that's extremely time consuming. And to be honest, for a building of that size, I'm not sure the consultancy fees to do that work would actually justify the savings that might um, incur out of the modeling. So the in-between is sort of um, an enhanced benchmark which we did um, through the BP and essentially working with the guys on site. Like ACOM, we struggled with the amount of meters. There were 80 meters in the building, including three for lifts. Um, on the other hand, most of them took at least one year to be available 
on the BMS, and when I say available, I don't mean reliable, <laughs> available on the BMS. And for one year, essentially, I relied on the FM team taking manual readings of the main meters. Without the FM team being that much, that helpful, the study couldn't have happened on a modern building with 80 meters. Um, we also have huge gaps in some of the data. So for some items, like lifts, we have half-hourly data. For others, we just have annual. Um, in terms of the energy consumption overall, um, so the top end is the user-specified benchmark because our hotel is special. So we've modified the benchmark to account for the fact that it has two restaurants. The mid one is the raw TM46 benchmark and the bottom one is our actual consumption. Um, so the gas consumption is actually quite high, which we didn't expect, to be quite honest, because often in modern buildings we do find that gas consumption is lower than benchmarks. Um, I'll come to some of that. Largely is to do with the hot water consumption, but probably not only. Electricity is much higher than benchmarks which we find in most buildings now. Um, the CHP was, um, well, it took a lot of our time, partially because the thermal stores had been removed, and so, surprise, surprise, the CHP struggled to operate during the summer when demand was just on and off. So it took us basically three years, almost to the day, to get it working to what had been the original design. So actually it now operates 12 hours a day, even in the summer. I have to say that some of it was driven by us and some of it was driven by the local authority who actually requested the contractor to submit what had been offered at the time of the energy strategy. There's not many local authorities that are technical enough to request that. Um, what was also interesting is that the CHP actually had a good quality assurance certificate. So without the local authority asking for something, the client was entitled to think everything was going well. Um, again, as many buildings, a lot of the energy consumption is unregulated, which means that it's even more difficult for us to predict, and we can also as designers say that it's not our fault anyway. So a lot of it is catering and to some extent IT in the bedrooms. But really, the kitchens in that hotel use a third of the gas and roughly a third of the electricity used by the overall. Um, the other big component of the sustainability strategy is water. And on average, the hotel uses roughly 600 liters per bedroom sold. So that's you know five times the building regs allowance for an individual to use water in new buildings in your resi. Some of it is used by kitchens, and I can't tell you how much because um, of the meters issues. But 600 liters, I mean, there are baths with 400 liters in that um, bedroom. And the issue is that people actually love it. So we can't go next time we do a luxury hotel and as sustainability consultant, encourage more efficient baths because it's a big part of their selling point. And we know that because we did some analysis of the guest feedback. It's not a scientific methodology. It took a lot of our time, and um, you have to be a bit obsessional to do that. But essentially, we went on TripAdvisor and reviewed what people talked about and how often they talked about it and in what way. So overall on TripAdvisor, the ratings are extremely good, um, and the hotel is very well rated. What we did is count how often people talk about various issues. So the first group is bedrooms, and surprisingly, people talk a lot about their bedrooms. What I didn't expect is how often they talk about how big the bath is and how big the bed is. There are two very big criteria for users. Um, so, um, quality of service, location, food, amount of food, again, not quality, amount of food, <laughs> facilities. Um, so again, these are all issues that don't have much to do with us as designers. But the fact that the staff was mentioned so often by guests is quite important for us, actually, because it did cover up a few issues that probably would have been more important in another hotel if they didn't have that good staff. Um, <clears throat> to pick on one, um, 
and to show that the TripAdvisor method actually works to some extent, what we did is we, did, um, we counted these reviews in the first six months, and then we did it again a year later. And in the first six months, roughly half and half um, in the people loved or hated the controls. So as you can see, um, brave technology. Uh, so they were quite nicely designed control systems, but which actually at the beginning were quite difficult for people to use and which were not very well adjusted. So some people loved it and others literally wrote on TripAdvisor, this is so smart, it's making me feel stupid. <laughs> so we and the hotel did some fine tuning and a year later, two thirds of the people actually loved the controls. And now, I went recently, hardly anyone mentions them, except to say that, you know, it's fantastic, it's high tech, they feel like James Bond. Um, but again, I think in a hotel with, where the staff wouldn't be so good, you wouldn't necessarily get these benefits because the guests in that boutique hotel have a very good service and someone takes them to the room, explains to them how to open the blinds, how to, open the how to turn on the lights. You, as a designer, you can't rely on that for every building you work on. Um, with the staff, we, need, we did more boring BUS surveys. Um, and again, they, they brought up interesting issues about, again, complexity, which we find on many buildings, but also about essentially the hotel being victim of its success. So there's many more events because the hotel is very busy which means that the many uses of the hotel sometimes do conflict with each other. So you get noise from the bar that annoys the hotel guests or the people in the conference center. Um, another important fact, so overall satisfaction was good. It was in the top 10% of user satisfaction, but it also had the single highest score for um, for effectiveness of response to requests for change. So essentially, the FM guy was amazing. Um, so good that he was poached, and so good that he's been poached back very recently. Um, but there's no doubt this influences a lot the overall satisfaction. And then overall, a lot of the, um, the things that people didn't quite like were to do with that success of the hotel and the fact that it's a dense urban lo London location. So there's quite a pressure on the ground floor and the various uses between where people come in, who they see, what they hear. Um, and as in many buildings, there were conflict and problems with, say, access for maintenance. So in the first year, access to the distribution boards was hidden um, behind the artwork, which meant that the restaurant had to be closed every time there was a problem. Um, it has since been changed. But it's one of the things that really didn't quite work during construction in the lack of m and &E support for the detail of how things would operate. And that's, I think, partly to do with the DNB arrangement. Um, I think in terms of the lessons, as everyone, we concluded that you should keep things simple, which is not a new conclusion, and that FM matter but also, particularly for hotels, the difficulty is that they don't stop. You don't get the opportunity you have in offices for weekend works or evening works. So if your commissioning period was compromised, you're really, really stuck to fix anything. And I think that's why it took us, for example, three years to get the CHP to work in the end. Thank you very much, Julian, to the other two speakers. Uh, we've got time for a few minutes uh, of questions now. So again, could you wait, please, until the uh, microphone uh, comes round to you? So uh, who'd like to uh, kick off with the, uh, with the first question? Yes, one down the front. Hi, uh, Tom Dollard, Bollard Thomas Edwards. Um, we've, had, we've heard a lot today from BP being done in the first three years of um, occupation. I'm wondering if any of you have been involved in BP after five or ten years and whether you see this being more popular in the future with the advent of smart technology, smart metering that a lot of customers are getting used to. Um, 
Well, I, I guess I'd say that we, we haven't been involved in informal um, POE, but we, have, we do an awful lot of work on existing estates, particularly for universities and, and people like that. So owner occupiers of buildings who, who are interested in um, you know, reducing the energy consumption of their buildings for, for a number of reasons, probably because they've got different, slightly different drivers to perhaps you know, com the commercial sector. Um, and we see that becoming more popular, certainly, uh, probably because energy prices are increasing. And, you know, like I say, there's the, there are those other external drivers who really think about the way your your uh, portfolio of buildings is performing. But not, not strictly speaking, a POE in this form. Um, I don't think I've done anything. Um, yeah, we have. We, we actually revisited um, National Trust, uh, HELIS, um, for... It had its own P, um, BP done, um, and then we revisited it um, when we were undertaking our work on Woodland Trust. Um, so actually, that was running from when it op when it first occupation in 2006 or no 2004, I think it was. Um, so and and what we had the work that we had gone and done initially had definitely fed back into the process. And the energy levels had come down considerably. Um, and one of the real shocks for us was the catering um, and the IT. Um, it's the two big, two big ones, unfortunately. And um, I'd like to say that we got that totally right at Woodland Trust. Um, we didn't, but then we have the opportunity to put that right again with this BP. So, so I think it's a real informed process. And you're right, it shouldn't stop after necessarily two, three years of occupation. You need to revisit it and see what should be done better. Um, but I think we've done that at Helis, and we've brought down the initial calculations quite considerably to both the catering and the IT facilities. Um, I think for us, it's true that we had, um, we had a bit of a hybrid BP scope, um, because we knew it would start when the hotel finished. So it wasn't really POE the first year, and we just knew that it would be more about the handover. Um, in terms of the promises of smart buildings, maybe bitten by the amount of data on metering, at the moment I'll wait and see, because it's, you know, it wouldn't be the first time we're promised that technology is going to give us lots of data, and in the end, what we're still lacking is someone to spend the time and have the intellect to sift through it and make sense of it. So I'm hoping, but um, I'll wait. Tamsin, Tamsin Tweddle, Max Fordham. Um, how has your attitude to, or your approach to designing energy metering changed as a result of having to deal with both a huge amount of data and the challenges of getting it to work? Um, okay, so I, I would say that um, the approach to design perhaps isn't, isn't necessarily the thing that's changed so much. I mean, there, there's, there are plenty of meters going in. I suppose, apart from the fact that perhaps there are too, meter, too many meters going in, uh, and the reason for them going in is perhaps not the right reason I said, to, to, to um, comply with a BREAM credit or to comply with building regs or whatever, and rather than thinking about a, a strategy in its own right, and also, uh, as you say, thinking about the people who are going to be using that data afterwards. So I think, for, for me, one of the key things is, is that, is actually having a strategy, rather than just you know ticking the box of BREAM or PILE or whatever, it's actually developing a strategy and sort of saying, well, how is this energy going to be used? What is going to be useful to know? Um, uh, and trying to spot where those gaps might be before they, before they come along, I suppose, are, are key things. Um, the, the big issue for me, though, is, is uh, because even if we didn't do anything else and we just carried on doing meeting as we're doing at the moment, the big issue is actually getting it working once you're, once you're in there. So, you know, that whole thing about early reconciliation of the metering system as soon as it goes in, making sure it's commissioned properly, making sure it's connected up, you know, making sure you've got a system there that can actually read it. Um, and those kind of things are really fundamental. And I think until we sort that stuff out, um, you know, even, even the existing meter we're doing at the moment just isn't, isn't, really, isn't really worth, worth the time they're putting into it, I think. No, and I think um, what we've learned massively is the importance of soft landings, really, and to, to take the briefing for such like right from the outset um, and have buy-in from everybody and, and work with the FM manager at the, you know, obviously there's a lot of speculative stuff that goes on, but you know, when you've got an end client in sight, there's no excuse not to have that kind of communication and, and soft landings approach throughout the whole project. Um, that's really 
Hello, uh, my name is Nzube, um, I'm building, ser building services engineer for Capita. I just had a question primarily for Julie. Um, with regard to um, uh, the, the, the hotel, uh, the, the boutique hotel you mentioned, you mentioned that sort of Holly did work up to sort of Reba stage D, sort of slash 3A, um, and then thereafter there was a DMB sort of procurement route. But my question is, you know, you mentioned that the contract that took thermal storage out um, and, I, and I'm assuming this is a VE item, you know, save cost. But, and, and, and that had operational issues um, when, when the building was completed. But do you, do you, um, do you have a, w was there the opportunity, first of all, maybe to sort of effectively just object to, to, to that sort of um, uh, 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 action, assuming maybe you had sort of technical advisory sort of capability. But, uh, also, is, do, do, you, do you have a, almost like a recommendation of how you can sort of prevent um, these things from sort of falling through the cracks and making sure that the, the design intent uh, right from the early stages can be carried through uh, to completion? Don't go DNB. No, I'm, jo I'm joking. Um, so I'm going to try to, um, yeah, so yes, to some extent we had the opportunity because as you say, we had plant monitoring services, say. Um, first of all, that's, that's actually quite loose ad, as a definition, and many people interpret it in different ways, um, depending on, well, their own experience, their own sense of duty, and also, to be quite blunt, how busy they are. So this was a recession job. The contract was bought during the recession, and there's no doubt it influenced quite a lot of the outcomes, and I think that's the case in quite a few of the BP projects where people just didn't have the resources or the budget in the first place. So we did uh, make strong um, recommendations against it. It happened anyway, and to be quite honest, I don't quite know because another issue that often happens when buildings have problems is that the main staff have actually left. So you, again, you do lose so much information. You can have as many procedures and quality processes in place as you want. Once you lose someone, it's not quite the same. Um, so I don't quite know why it was approved. Um, I think I can say the M&E contractor regret it. Um, not the FM team, because it means they have a big empty space in the basement that they can use as storage <laughs> for their own junk. Um, certainly what it's changed, and that also relates to the approach to meters, is I think I'm, I'm more vocal about the importance of continuity, whether it's a novated arrangement with a red flag clause of some sort, or actually beefed up client monitoring services. I think a lot of clients don't necessarily understand how little they get from M&E when they pay for client monitoring. Um, and it, it's not that the M&E engineers don't do that much, but they, it's just, there seems to be a bit of a gap in the expectation, um, which doesn't necessarily happen with architects. So, but, well, to link up to that, someone mentioned at the beginning, um, at the early sessions, a project by Innovate UK on procurement, and I'm actually working on that. So to, to check whether there are trends, actually, because it's very easy to say it was the fault of DNB, but maybe not. So we are looking at all the BP projects. Thank you, Julie. We've probably got time just for one very quick last question. Thank you. It's Sarah Carson from SIBSI. Um, this is kind of speaking in my previous life as a frustrated energy manager, being given metering that does not work. I really wanted to kind of echo Tamsin's question. Um, it's really great that individuals are kind of like looking at in their businesses how to hand over better, but a very small proportion of uh, projects, especially public sector projects, have soft landings outside of government soft landings. So what should we be doing as professionals in a built environment industry to kind of make metering, I know it's one element of lots of other things, but for an FM manager, an energy manager, it's probably one of the most important things. You can't measure, can't manage what you can't measure. So what can we do outside of 
the kind of complexities of a project and time and program and budget to actually make metering work for an energy manager? Uh, uh, okay, I, I think the one thing, and, and this isn't perhaps outside the context of the project, but the one thing I would recommend on every project is that very early reconciliation of the metering system. Because then whatever it is you've got installed, whether it's exactly what you want or it's not quite what you want or whatever, at least you can be sure that it's actually working and giving you some reliable information. So if you, there's one thing that you do on a project, I would say it's early reconciliation of the metering system. Um, yeah, we can have a talk about energy management afterwards because that's a whole—that's maybe a whole other topic. But uh, from a point of view of a, of a capital project, that's the one thing I would recommend. I think. Um, I think what we took away on um, Woodland Trust was to take somebody, a real energy efficient um, energy consultant, f to handle some of the areas that perhaps were earmarked as being potential high carbon loading areas, such as IT and. Um, and catering and taking those uh, right the way through from initial briefing with the client through to um, uh, the POE basically, right the way through the process and just um, to, to have that communication and um, consultation right the way through the process and, and I, think, I think without that basically the project's going to fail somewhere at some point because and especially with procurement and the fact that so many of these buildings are sort of detached from briefing and the end, the conclusion of the project, you know, something is set up to fail. And you, I think the, the more of the team you've got through the process that's, that's actually taking it through from briefing to the final stages, I think the better. Um, but with an energy consultant, I think that might be the way forward. Okay, thank you. I wonder if you'd join me in just thanking the, uh, the speakers again. All right.